uh, we are to break bread together. All right. Uh, Jesus was really sweet. Can we have a kiss? What? Yeah, kiss here. We're, we're doing the So if you get something, bonus, the only thing we got. If you got something to drink, whatever it is. Yeah, so whenever uh, the subject of communion, Lord's Supper, comes up, um, my favorite go-to passage is, is 1 Corinthians 11. Um, and uh, I, I love this passage because it's really dear to me because it was uh, the understanding and studying of this passage is actually a big turning point in my understanding of who God is, who we are in my uh, relationship with Jesus, it really opened my eyes up into you know, how we should be ourselves and how we should be Jesus through the lens of, of Jesus and his understanding and his wisdom. All right, because, uh, and, and I read right here, in the 11 says, therefore whoever eats the bread, drinks a cup of the Lord, and an unworthy matter should be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So I always got taught, okay, you see, you need to be worthy to partake of Jesus. So if you're unworthy, you need to, but a man must examine us. So we need to examine ourselves, right? And that part of the service, we all break up and, you know, you confess all your sins and make sure you're worthy to partake of Jesus, right? And that never seemed right to me, you know? And actually, through my pastor, you know, started studying this passage and, and the way he broke it down was like, he said, unworthy is a verb. So it's not an adjective. Is all, and if you know grammar, adverbs modify action, right? They modify verbs, right? Not nouns. So he's not talking about the person. Paul here, who's writing this, is not talking about the person. He's not talking about you being worthy or unworthy. He's talking about the way you're doing it. Are your actions worthy? He's like, why are we doing this? Okay? And going back to the context, he's writing to the Corinthians. What they were doing was they were just having a big old party, and everybody was getting drunk, and, you know, and there was just zero regard to you know, in reverence and acknowledging what Jesus had done for them and why Jesus sat down, you know, with, with his disciples on the Passover meal and broke bread with them and said, this is my body. This is, this is my, my blood. You know, since we're just not even considering that, that's not what we're remembering. And Jesus said, every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And that's what Paul was reminding us. We're doing this in remembrance of Jesus. You know, that's the, the center of our existence. And that's why we should do it, right? Not just to have a good time. Although, you know, it should be a good time, you say don't have a good time, but it shouldn't be the reason why we're doing it. So, uh, with that said, let's give thanks for the body and blood of Christ and partake. Right. Father, we thank you because you gave Jesus on the cross. And his body was broken for the healing of our body, Father. And his blood was shed for the redemption of us, Father. For the payment of our sins, Father. And there's not enough thanks, Father. And we do this, Father, we partake here today, Father, we break this bread. We uh, drink this liquid, Father, representing his body and his blood. And remember, Father, that he died and he resurrected for us out of love and no other reason, Lord. Amen. Yeah, the kids can head on over here with April and Scarlett. So Mike doesn't bore them to death. That's a fact.
All right. Um, me and Mike were trying to figure this out. You know, it's like, well, we're gonna keep on. We can do this together. You know, and I was like, yeah, that seems like a good idea. Let's kind of tag team this thing a little bit, All right? And uh, and um, he asked me, well, what, what do you think? What are your thoughts? You know, what should we teach on? You know, and I was like, well, let me think about it a little bit. You know, let me meditate. Let me pray on it. So, and. Uh, Day or two later, as I was putting uh, my kids to bed, and I love uh, my eight-year-old Judah, and I put him to bed, it's like it's like his brain just comes on, and it's like question after question, and asking my opinion on things, and you know, things we he experienced during the day, he kind of starts he brings them up and, and asks me questions about it and why, and, you know, uh, a lot of times it has to do with baseball and Mookie Betts and the Dodgers and. Stuff like that, which is great. I love that. You know, uh, definitely a kid after his dad's own heart. You know, um, but uh, lately he's been getting into this this thing where it's like, Dad, why do I have to go to school? I don't like school. You know, of course, you know he's eight years old. He's getting to the age where it's like, it's just it's like school isn't fun. You know. Um, so, and uh, and here's the one thing I always told my kids. You know, when, whenever they, they bring up this thing, like, well, why do we go to school? Why? And I was like, I was like, well, you go to school is to become a more complete person. You know, it's like, well, what does that mean? And you know, I started saying, and I started explaining to them, it's like, you got to better, you got to get knowledge and understanding of this world, understanding of other humans, understanding of you know science, math, history, and all those things to better understand yourself better understand God, to better understand others, and know others so that you can love better. That's why, that's why you go to school, you know, to become a more complete human being. And uh, and that night, though, you know, it's like, you know, this was maybe like the sixth, seventh, eighth time that he had asked, why do I go to school? You know, why do I have to go to school? I don't like school. You know, and, and, that's, and I told him, and here was my response, was like, because ignorance and stupidity is the reason why bad things happen. <laughs> and I was like, and then like the next day, I think it was even that night, I texted Mike. I was like, I got it. Knowledge and wisdom versus ignorance and stupidity. And that's that should be the topic. That's what we should we should we should teach on. All right. So obviously, you know, when we when we talk about wisdom, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is Proverbs, right? Oh, Solomon, you know, wisdom. You know, the, the, the wisdom that he imparts to us, you know, the author of Proverbs, Solomon, you know, in, in that whole entire book, you know, and, uh, and I want to go to Proverbs too. Right. And here uh, Solomon is writing and he's actually addressing this to his son and in verse in chapter one and chapter two, it's actually a, uh, an alphabetic poem in chapter two, where each there's 22 verses and it's actually one big, long run on sentence. But each each verse actually begins with uh, with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it was a type of, of poem that was common during this time. And it says, uh, "My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord." All right. Oh. Uh, so here we have, right, in verse one, he's, uh, he's speaking to his son, verses two to five. You know, um, Solomon is telling his son, seek wisdom, right? Seek knowledge. Right? Um, and then he goes into why. And then just uh, actually, just taking a step back a little bit. I just thought about this a minute uh, here. Um, 
there's a comedian I love. His name is John Mulaney. You guys call him Moody. He's real famous, right? And he loves to tell this joke. You know, he grew up. He grew up in Catholicism. Actually, went to a Catholic school. And, and he talks about you know, kind of like the, the silliness of some of the Old Testament stories and some of the things he learned. And, and he talks about the story of Solomon, right? That we all know that most of the world knows. Where it's like the two women, right, who had the children, and most likely they were prostitutes. And one of the children died because she kind of rolled over him and smothered him in her sleep. And then they, she switched babies with the other woman in the night. And then in the morning, like they started fighting over whose baby this actually was, right? And they go before Solomon to for him to to discern, you know, whose whose baby it actually is, you know, to make judgment, right? And what's Solomon's response? Let's slice this baby in half, and you can each have half, right? And that almost it's like ludicrous, right? You know, and, and the. You know, and obviously, you know, we know the story, right? The one woman says, oh, no, you know, don't kill the baby. I'd rather she have it, you know, than for my son to die. And the other woman's kind of like, yeah, go ahead. Chop them in half. I'll take half, right? And John Lady, you know, he, he talks about how, like, you know, it's, it's kind of, he looks at the silliness of it, where he's like, how do, he's like, I am just an idiot who would be walking down the street, and I saw you trying to cut a baby in half. I would be like, hey, you probably shouldn't do that, right? It's like, I'm not a mother. It's like, it doesn't take, you know, a true mother to recognize that this, this is wrong, right? To, to cut a baby in half, you know? And then he just kind of, you know, he looks at the cylinders of things, you know? And, and, and from the outskirts, you know, it's kind of like, well, why would a human being be like, yeah, go ahead, cut that baby in half, you know? It's like, how does that even make any sense, any rational sense to any human, you know? Um, but we'll come and circle around back to that. On, on the psychology there, all right, as we go forward, all right. So, um, keep moving forward, all right, that you will discern fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God, all right. He says, why, why should we seek wisdom, all right? Why should we put this effort to seek knowledge and wisdom? Because so that we can discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For example, well, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He starts up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice, and he preserves the way of his godly ones. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity in every good course. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discernment will guard you. Understanding will watch over you. Are you saying, we need to seek these things from God. God will give them to us. It is a gift that God gives them wisdom, understanding, understanding, discernment, our gift from God. It says, well, why does God give us these things? It says in verse 12, to deliver you from the way of evil. For the man who speaks perverse things from those who leave the path, leave the path of unrighteousness to walk in the ways of darkness, who delight in doing evil and rejoice in the perversity of evil, whose paths are crooked and whose are and who are devious in their ways to deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words, that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to earth, and her tracks lead to the dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the path of life. So you walk in the way of good men, and keep to the path of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land, and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land. And the treacherous will be uprooted. That's what God says. says. Why do we seek wisdom? Why does God give us this gift? So to deliver us from the evil way. So why? Because if we follow evil, you know, there will be fruit. If we follow God, there will be fruit from that. And that's you know the, the ending of that chapter. He talks about the fruit of our faith or our action, the fruit of us seeking, you know, wisdom, the fruit of us seeking knowledge and the truth of God. All right. So essentially, you know, he's saying we need to think like God. All right. So we need to think like God. Let's say this. God is what? Anybody? What is God? Mike. Love. love, right? God is love. So we need to think like love. Make sense there? Yeah. 
know, our wisdom, our knowledge, our understanding should all be built upon something, which is who God is. All right. So let's move flash forward here. About a thousand years. Uh, Mark. I mean, sorry, not Mark. Matthew. Matthew 23. Right. Uh, a lot of heavy language in this passage, right? But Jesus basically, you know, Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees here. Right? He says, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you do and observe, do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them, to move them with so much a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they brought in their uh, factories. factories yes, and lengthen the tassel of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by men. So Jesus saying, right, the rabbis, right, the spiritual religious leaders of the time, you know, these are men who literally from birth were trained to understand the Old Testament. They literally had the Old Testament memorized. So all the knowledge in the world was up here in their head. And he's saying, but, you know, they, they have it all up here, but they don't practice it. You know, they, what they do is hypocritical. He said, well, and he says right there, he says, why are they, he says, why is it hypocritical? Why are they not, you know, he said, why are they not practicing this knowledge that they understand? And he says, because of the reason they're doing it, right? Their effort, you know, what's their purpose, right? Um, their motivation, their foundation is not out of this, right? They're seeking the approval of men. They like to look good, right, in front of people. You know, they, they put on the show and the dance out in the crowds at the temple, right? And it's just, it's for their own look so they can look good. That's their motivation behind what they do. Right? Um, then Jesus goes on. Uh, goes on how, they, I mean, and I'll skip a couple verses because he talks about how they they're always looking for respect in the marketplace and they like to be called rabbi and whatnot. He says, then Jesus kind of retorts this and he says, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humble and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And Jesus comes back to this idea of like servitude. Servant. And these things tie into this. This should be the motivating factor. This should be the purpose and reason why, you know, when you take the knowledge and you apply it through, through this, you know, through the lens and the filter of love and servitude and humility, what results is love. And that's what is going to come out. It's what the fruit's going to be. It's all if you... Try to, if you take this knowledge and you filter it through self-centeredness, you filter it through, you know, me first, I, boasting, pride, then the result's going to be not good, you know. Um, the, most of the atrocities of this world that have been justified by, you know, in the name of God happen because of that. Right? Um, Too much time, so I'll jump forward a little bit here. All right. Now let's talk about stupidity a little bit. All right. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he was, uh, if you don't know who he is, he's a German theologian who lived during the 30s. Right. He actually was put to death in 1944. All right. He was a Christian. Right. Uh, some of his writings have influenced 
Christianity in very deep ways. Man. And here, okay, and think about the context. Right? I'm talking about a German theologian in the 1930s, right? You guys all understand that what was happening in history at that time, right? Uh, you know, the rise of, you know, of Hitler and the Nazis and, and the Holocaust, right? So in the context of, of what is happening in his culture, in his society, it, with his people and his country, right? Um, he wrote, um, and actually from prison, he was arrested in 1943. And uh, while he was in prison, he, he died and he was executed in 1945. So his last couple of years, he lived in prison. Um, he wrote a lot of letters and, and papers, you know, that have been put together and, and just amazing stuff that he wrote, you know, and it's, you know, a man who was trying to understand humanity, a man who was trying to understand how did this occur in our culture and our society? How did this occur in our world? Right? And, uh, and he talks about, you know, in the context of that, he's talking about stupidity, and his statement is uh, stupidity is a more, more dangerous enemy of the good than malice. So he starts off with a statement, you know. He says, you know, when people are just evil and they're motivated by being evil, it's pretty easy to see that and pretty easy to stop and point out, hey, that's wrong what you're doing, right? It's not correct. You know, but when somebody is claiming good, doing things in the name of God, has the knowledge, can, can you know, dance around in the scriptures and be quoting the scriptures and, and be doing things, you know, based upon this knowledge they have of what is good, you know, it's very difficult to then kind of counteract that and be like, well, the, the reason this is wrong is because, well, because, well, you're coding, you're just misquoting it, you know, you're misusing it, you know, and, you know, and he, when he was talking about this, that's kind of like, uh, you know, um, he started then equating stupidity as something that is not, it's not necessarily an intellectual defect. You know, he called it a human defect. So when you get people who have a lot of knowledge and you filter it through humanity, which is our sin nature, our defects, you know, our shortcomings of God, the result is, you know, and he doesn't use this term, but you know, I like I like to use this term. It's like it's almost like it's a it's a moral issue. Or it's like our morality is off base. You know, and I don't like to use that term morality a lot because then you start getting into like, well, what's moral? Is it a set of rules? That's automatically what we think, right? Morality is like, you don't do this, you don't do that, you do do this, you do that. That's not what morality is. You know, morality is based on, again, going back to Proverbs and what Solomon's saying, you know, our under, you know, taking our knowledge and our wisdom from God and what Jesus was saying, you know, putting it through the filter of servitude and humility. And the result of that, you know, is, is what should come out of the other side should be what it aligns with God, you know, but with our, our human nature, our self-centeredness doesn't align with God. And, uh, you know, and, and he was, um, you know, or it's really simple. It's really easy, you know, to uh, take our knowledge of things somebody who lacks the knowledge of those things and for us to be like, oh, I'm smarter than that person, right? But I'm like, start deeming this person as stupid or dumb or ignorant, right? And we automatically kind of boast ourselves up and, and put ourselves on a higher pedestal than that, all right? Now, um, and to uh, move a little bit forward here, it says, oh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer then gets into, it's like, well, it's like you really can't reason with stupidity. It's all like it's it's kind of like it's not about somebody not having understanding of a certain thing. It's like it's their discernment of what they're of, of, of their knowledge, right? And he says, you know, so, um, and he starts talking about stupidity being like this unseen gel, you know, that people need liberation from. He says you can't and you can't reason a person out of it. And uh, actually, his quote here is this. Internal liberation of human, of human beings to live the responsible life before God is the only genuine way to overcome stupidity. So he's, then he starts talking about, you know, it's like, it's our action here. It's like, how do we counteract, you know, stupidity? You know, and again, 
in the context of what he's talking about, right? He's trying to understand. He's like, how do we counteract something like the Holocaust? It's like, you're not going to go in there, you know, into where all the Nazis are, you know, into a Nazi gathering and get up there and start reasoning with them about why what they're doing is wrong. It's like, that just ain't going to work. You know, it's like these people, moral, their moral base is completely off center. And what you're going to say to them is just, there's no reasoning with it. You know, and he said, and the only way we can counteract evil, the only thing we can counteract what is wrong is like, it's by all us ourselves, you know, living this way and being an example. And when people witness that and they see the fruit of that, that's what liberates people. That's what brings people out of quote unquote stupidity and our actions. Okay. Um, going back here a little bit to the the Pharisees, right, and what they were, you know, and their shortcomings, right. Um, and it's like why, you know, the 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 Pharisees, the religious leaders, they lacked, you know, what or Proverbs two talks about, which is, you know, their understanding. Um, Back to the here. Okay. Their discernment, all right. Their hearts were not inclined to understanding. All right. They did not cry for discernment. So they did not lift up their voice for understanding. They did not seek it as silver and hidden treasures. All right. You know, and, and having this lack of discernment and understanding it's where, again, the most atrocious things in human history have occurred because people have gotten, they've talked, they've taken the, this knowledge of the scriptures and applied it not through love, but through self-centeredness, human understanding, All right? Now, um, one of my favorite examples of... Uh, of uh, action in the Bible is Rahab, all right? And I always think it's funny because like, all right, what did Rahab do, right? Rahab was declared righteous, she did was faithful, and her actions were correct, and what did she do? She lied. She broke one of the Ten Commandments. It's like, how does that even line up correctly? It's like, how does that even, you know, how can you literally break one of the Ten Commandments and be declared righteous? You know, it's almost like this contradiction. You know, but it's, and, and here's the then modern day example I use about Rahab is and, and going in, you know, in line with, uh, with, with uh, historically, you know, for Dietrich Bonhoeffer's talking about, right? I always say this, like, right? So pretend you're living, right? 1930s Germany, right? And uh, you're hiding Jews in your basement, right? That whole basement full of Jews, right? And the Gestapo comes to your door and you knock, right? And the answer is like, yes, can I help you? And they say, do you have any Jews in your basement? And your response is, I cannot tell a lie. There's a bunch of Jews in my basement. All right. I can't lie. It would be immoral for me to lie. I'd be breaking one of the Ten Commandments if I lied. So I can't lie to you. You know, it's, it's ridiculous, right? Your response would be like, nope, there ain't no Jews here. Look somewhere else. All right. So, you know, it's, you know, and, and there it is, right? It's like, well, what's, so it's the reason why we have life. Why are we lying? Because we're trying to protect other people, right? We're trying to do what's right. You know, we're being motivated by this. We're being motivated by trying to do the right thing, you know, by, by righteousness, by justice, our understanding of justice and righteousness. We're kind of, you got to discern, you know, the situation and do what is correct, what aligns with God, you know? And again, it's like, okay. So that all makes sense, right, Omar, right? You know? wisdom knowledge right we need to seek those things or else you know and we got to see them through the lens of love through the lens of the correct you know motivation of servitude and, and humbleness or else we fall in this danger of being you know ignorant and stupid and doing the doing bad things all right well i want to take a little step further here right talk about like the danger that then we fall into and this is something that i struggle with a lot all right 
I have a lot of contempt for humanity. Okay. Um, I don't, I've never, well, let's go back even further back. Right? You guys all remember MySpace? Yeah. Right? Remember that? Yeah, all right. Okay. I always say, you know what? I'm going to rewind even further than that. 1995. All right. First time I got on the internet. Right? 1995. I was a freshman in college. And we got on the internet. We AOL, right? I, we actually, we, from our campus, you couldn't dial out. And it was really cool because, like, I found out a way how to, like, how to time it correctly where you had to pick up the phone and punch in a special code and hang it up. And the computer was able to dial out. And we actually got online. And like it became this cool thing where like everybody on our dorm would come to our room because we're like we were able to get on the internet and nobody else could, right? So at, you know at the beginning of the internet before most people knew what it was, right? We got on AOL and we get into these these chat rooms, right? And I remember the first time I got into the chat rooms, you know, we're like, what's the subject? What's going on here? And you could begin to guess already way back in 1995 what the topic of conversation was. You know, I mean, we're talking right, sex politics, the same garbage conversation that everybody has, to do, right? And I thought to myself at that point, oh my gosh, this is gonna completely change the world, but it can absolutely destroy our culture and society. I literally, that is the thought that came through my mind at 18 years old, the first time I got on the internet, you know? And again, fast forward a little bit more, it's like when we came, you know, when the MySpace thing came, came around, and I thought, and I saw what people were doing there. I was like, oh my gosh, okay, here it is. It's like, it's, it's coming to fruition. It's like, even the name, my space. This is my area of the world to put up, you know, that I have my own stage of the world that I can show you how great I am, you know? And I always used to make the joke that it should be called your space and you should open up, you should do these web pages about how great other people are and not all about yourself. You know, and even uh, my brother and sister in law leaving for Christmas in here, they got me a shirt that said, My space sucks. Because how much I was, you know, not into my space. Anyways, you know, social media was nothing that something that never appealed to me. There's something that never really, you know, I don't know. I just, I always saw it and looked at it and like, there's just, I don't know, just I always felt it was like a dirty place, right? Not to put down others who, you know, who love it. I know Mike's love it. You know. I'm still on it. Yeah. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying, give up. I'm not saying go get rid of your Facebook page or anything, whatever, you know. Um, but, uh, but just it's true, as I said, and then, you know, but this platform, right, in our culture now, it's like, it's so easy, you know, and it's never changed. You know, humanity hasn't changed. You know, the platform has changed. It's so easy for, our stupidity to then be broadcasted worldwide. And it's real easy to see now. Every time you turn around and you, know, you see somebody doing something that's just, just like, what in the world is, is going on? You know, the world's coming to an end. You know, and, and again, it's real easy for us to get to the place where we look at something like that. And I said, this is, this is something I struggle with to begin to then start having contempt for people, to be, to be thinking, my gosh, you know. Look at these liberal Democrats. Not that I don't like liberal Democrats. You know, I love them all. It's a how can how stupid can people be? You know, why are people so stupid? And it's something that you know, I, I think that within myself. It's like, why are people so stupid? How can people be so dumb? You know, people that I know who are super knowledge, super smart. You know, they have all this under, you know, all this, this knowledge in their brain, and and their conclusion of truth is so off base. It's like, how can somebody so smart be so dumb, right? Um, and and it's, it's real easy to, to fall into this trap of us having this contempt for humanity. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? After he starts talking about stupidity, he actually gets into this a little bit. He starts talking about like the way we should view humanity. And, so, and that's kind of like the, our, our contempt. But he actually uses that term. He says, our contempt for humanity, it's like, it's real easy to, Look at people who we deem stupid and not love them. Yeah. The truth is, like, I mean, and I said it, and people do that to each other all the time, right? I said, someone, you know, there's so many strong opinions out there, and the truth is, like, oh, these people think like me, and those people don't think like me. So I'm with those people, and those people are less than me. All right. And that's the trap we fall into, you know, that, and that doesn't at all align with this, right? It misaligns with that. All right. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer starts talking about 
Because the way we should start looking at humanity is through human suffering. Yeah, the prices. And reverse here a little bit, right? Circling around back to uh, John Mulaney and Solomon, right? And the story of chopping the baby in half, right? Um, have you, any of you ever known somebody who lost a child? I know at, at least there's, I know some people in the room here who have actually like, they didn't, uh, have had to dealt with the suffering of a miscarriage. You know, I personally have had to go through that and I can't, I mean, just that alone just really was, gosh, it was, it was heart wrenching. I couldn't even put it into words, you know, how devastated me and my family were when that occurred to us, you know, much less having an actual child who was already born a baby, you know, and losing that child. It's like, what kind of, you know, the state of mind I was in suffering through that made me start thinking some wacky, kooky things. Much less, I can't even imagine, like, you're sort of thinking about this woman here who lost her child. It's like, of course she was out in left field and to her, chopping a baby and a half seemed like a good idea. I'm like, this woman was suffering, you know, mentally and spiritually, the place she was at, who, who knows where she was at? You know, much less if, like, if her foundation was not built upon this, you know, if, if Jesus, you know, and God, you know, were the foundation of her existence, you know, when you go through that type of suffering, how, I said, how, I can't even imagine, you know, the state of mind where a person would be spiritually and emotionally, you know, you, you can't even begin to, to family. When we hear the stories that there were, were, you know, were husband and wife, you know, families where they do lose a child and you hear like a year later that they're divorced and they're both a mess because it just, it, it destroyed them. And since their foundation was not built upon this, it just, you know, it just completely derailed who they were. You know, um, so I said through the lens of that, then it's like it, it, that story kind of makes more sense. Then. It's like this woman who, who was suffering, her emotional and spiritual state must have just been so out of whack that this is literally to her like just chopping the baby and have seemed like a viable solution to end her suffering. You know, so again, so coming back to you know to us and today, you know and. And the way we view other humans, you know, it's like, for the most part, my understanding and my understanding of scripture and truth and trying to love the way Jesus loves, you know, most of what humanity does that seems atrocious to us is because of suffering, you know, and trying to empathize and sympathize with that is difficult, you know, because I, I got it all figured out. I'm, I love Jesus and I got my crap all together, you know, I would never do something like that. I'm smart. I got it all figured out, you know, and it's real easy for us, again, this contempt for others, you know, it's, it's easy to, to sow that seed and water it and let it sprout in our hearts, you know, but you got to come back to the way we under, you know, humility, you know, Jesus humbled himself and identified with humans. You know, how often do the Pharisees and people come and try to kind of trap Jesus in the corner of like and accuse him of something that's kind of, you know, you know, that's that's not true, but it's kind of based on Old Testament, you know, scriptures, and they try to trap him and put him in a corner. And his response isn't like to get into this shouting argument with them like we normally do, right? When someone writes on Facebook, you know, you know, oh, Jesus didn't really live, he's just a myth. You know, we think that if we scream louder that Jesus is real and historically, and the Bible is historically accurate, somehow we're going to convince these people, you know. It's like, that's not what Jesus did. You know, to the contrary, he usually told them to start going into some story that made zero sense to anybody and kind of left them kind of scratching their heads like, 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 I don't even know what this dude's talking about. It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, and his, his idea was like, I'm not going to reason with you people. All I can do is show you that I love and I love you, and I'm gonna submit to my father's will and to God's truth, and I'm gonna lay down my life for you. You know, that's how he appealed to st stupidity and ignorance. So, um, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Mike here.
right. I know I left them about 30 seconds. <laughs> clock, so. Yeah, I'll just give a closing thought. Okay. All right. Sorry, Mike. And you're good. You're good. My, my closing thought is that we tend to think of the opposite of ignorance or stupidity being knowledge. Um, but Jesus said things like, you, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have life, but they testify about me. And you refuse to come to me, that you would have life. It's the opposite of ignorance and stupidity isn't knowledge. It's the application of knowledge. So wisdom is about knowledge being applied. And so if you think about what is the wisdom of God? Well, the Bible says the wisdom of God is not an idea or a set of ideas, but a person. Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. So how do you know what wisdom is? It's not, it's not ideas. It's a person. So what did Jesus say? He didn't say, sit down and listen to me. He said, come and follow me. And at the end of his ministry, he said, everything you saw and heard in me, practice these things. So what is wisdom? It's the application of living a life that resembles the life of Jesus. Imitate me. Jesus said, imitate me. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate him. So if you think about wisdom, I, I think when Omar said love and loving people like Jesus and Jesus is love, God is love. I think wisdom is living out and embodying the truths that we see in the word of God. Who's more loving? Somebody who reads a bunch of books on love or a husband that actually takes his wife out on dates? Who's more loving? Who's more loving? Someone that reads a bunch of manuals on parenting or a mother or father that's still on the floor with her kids and build blocks? Who's more loving? Right? It's the application of it. You can't, you can't steer a parked car. It's You've got to move. And so... Love had its boots on. And in the same way, if we're to follow Jesus, it means that we actually live the stuff that we talked about. What is more spiritual, a Bible study on community or a table filled with people? Which one? The learning of it or the application of it? Which one is more spiritual? It's the application of it, right? So... Faith without works is dead, meaning that when we actually put the stuff that we're learning and hearing into practice in the course of the week, it, what, what we're reading comes to life. It literally walks out of the pages. That's what God's called us to do. So, yeah, thank you, Omar. And guys, like, it's not... It's not easy to get up. This guy has started a microchurch here. He's got a group of people that they're trying to form something and connect with people and reach people. You're, they're using this space and another brewery. So I just applaud Omar and his crew for their attempt to make a difference and reach people and gather people and just appreciate them. And Marge, I just love your passion this morning. Appreciate you. It's good to be here with all of you guys. Let me pray for you. Pray for this community. God, we thank you so much. Even the kids, <laughs> just hearing them going nuts right next to us. I, I love that they're having fun. I love that I heard my son last week when I went to basketball pictures telling his friend, dude, you should have been at church today. It was awesome. And that's what we want. We, we want kids that are excited about community and faith. We want families attempting to live this stuff out every day, not just talk about it, but walk it out as a community of people. So I just ask that you bless this place, this theater, these people that are teaming up together, families that are working together on mission, um, that you'd use both this space and the brewery um, Highway Manor that they meet at as well, and that you continue to uh, bring people around the table to have spiritual dialogue. We love you. We thank you for all of those who joined us online and ask that you bless each of their micro churches where they're at. Give us a great day and a great week living out these principles. We'll talk to you later. Amen. Great job, Omar.
See you guys. Adios. See you, bro.